another very special edition. We got our special guest, Richard, returned. Richard, how are you today? I'm doing well. I'm ready to talk about the Super Bowl. Awesome. I look forward to Good. Yeah. <laughs> learning all about the exceptional players. Actually, I'm kidding. I don't know shit about the Super Bowl. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is a kind of Schmidtian sport in some many ways. So. Mm. Yeah. And uh, we got... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, um, what did I say? Yeah, so this is the start of a series, actually. So we're starting with Schmidt's political theology. Next week, we're going to take up Jacques Derrida's appropriation and critique of mm. Schmidt in his Politics of Friendship. And then we're going to move to the Italian philosopher, uh, Giorgio Agamben, his work, uh, State of Exception, um, home, uh, Sovereign Power and Bare Life. And that's going to be split into two. So we're doing this Schmidt series, so it's going to be a lot of fun. And we have our... Friend Nils here joining us for that series. So Nils, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself because it's your first time being on this show. So what are you all about? Oh, you're muted there. Are you muted? I can't hear you. Can you turn your mic up or it's can't hear you? <laughs> this is why i don't do live i just <laughs> this always yeah we were, we were literally yeah. just talking off air i know he was thinking <laughs> fine <laughs> some 30 seconds ago and <laughs> hmm. well it says you're not muted hmm. okay oh no this is a good act. Maybe we should talk about the football game. <laughs> <laughs> he can hear us. Okay. All right. Test. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, audience, for being All super right, patient. He would. He, uh, there yeah. you are. Okay. Okay, yeah, it is. It was just the the yeah. headset needed to be restarted. Uh, yeah, where was I exactly? Uh, I'm Nils Wegner. I've done, I believe, two streams with Richard before, and uh, one with uh, Augustus, who who couldn't join us tonight. So uh, I guess uh, it still stands. Was mich nicht umbringt macht mich stärker. Just as it stands at the end of uh, Imperium. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I've uh, done my fair share of studies in uh, historical and cultural sciences. I graduated in 2014. After that, I uh, worked for three years for the one noteworthy publishing house of the European New Right in Germany, which is uh, Antaios. And uh, since then, I've been uh, freelancing as an author, translator, and copy editor. And uh, I've been having quite a knack for Schmidt for the past 12 years or so. So you might say for, for one Reich. Um, and uh, I've been bugging all my Twitter followers uh, with quotes by him for quite some time now. So I guess that's why uh, Tyler decided to invite me here. Definitely. Yeah. I originally, I saw you do an episode on Schmidt with Josh as well and Augustus. And I was, I was hoping to have Augustus, but of course he's in the situation he's in. And I think the trial is coming up on the 14th. So I wish him in the best. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, why don't you go ahead and introduce Schmidt and the text for us and then we'll jump yeah. into the discussion. Um, of course, introducing uh, Karl Schmidt in, in short is not that easy. <clears throat> but on the other hand, I believe that, uh, people who are following this uh, this program, this show, or, and are uh, interested in the, the dissident right uh, in general, no matter whether they are in the US or in Europe, um, might have or should possibly have uh, heard of uh, Schmidt by now because of his uh, outstanding uh, significance for right-wing thinking and even left-wing thinking by now. Um, he was a... Uh, a jurist, a political theorist. Uh, he was born in 1888 and died in uh, 1985 uh, at almost uh, 97 years of age. And uh, he's 
one of the most important uh, political thinkers, most important European political thinkers uh, of the 20th century. So uh, his uh, work, which is which is quite uh, quite diversified in uh, in in political writing, in essays, in uh, in jurisdiction and uh, and and uh, philosophy of history, uh, offers quite a lot of uh, gems. And uh, I believe his, of course, his his most important really political uh, work is the concept of the political. Then there are uh, certain rather essay, essayistic or theoretical works like Theory of the Partisan and mm -hmm. uh, his, his uh, groundbreaking work on uh, comparative uh, constitutional science. A, a, a field of studies which he more or less invented himself and uh, today we're going to talk about uh, one of his most prominent um let let's say uh works in the field of philosophy of the state and uh, of law which is uh, political theology this is uh, the 10th edition in german uh, political theology for chapters uh, on the concept of sovereignty, which uh, was originally published in 1922. The second edition was published in 1934, that is after the uh, rise to power of the National Socialist Party. Uh, it has only slightly been changed for this second edition. Um, and the third edition uh, came out only in 1979, which is six years before Schmidt's death. The uh, first English-speaking uh, edition in the US was put out uh, by MIT Press in 1985, uh, which is uh, the one you guys read, I believe. Uh, it has been translated by George Schwab, who was more or less a pioneer of uh, Schmidt studies in the uh, Anglosphere and a personal acquaintance of Schmidt, as far as I know. And uh, yeah, the book uh, is rather short, as are most uh, books by Schmidt. Uh, it's divided into the uh, already mentioned uh, four chapters about uh, the definition of sovereignty. Uh, then there's a chapter dedicated to the problem of sovereignty as the problem of the legal form and of the decision, which is the most uh, theoretical and uh, jurisdictional chapter and uh, then it gets uh, more essayistic and and polemic in a way uh, considering political theology in the third and uh, four counter-revolutionary or reactionary writers uh, who uh, positioned themselves against uh, the French Revolution and the uh, bourgeois revolutions of uh, the 19th century uh, which is uh, Joseph Dumestre uh, De Bonald and uh, Donoso Cortez. And uh, yeah, that's uh, the book we're talking about today. I have to say uh, beforehand, when you want to go into Schmidt and haven't read anything by him before, uh, as I said, he's published quite a lot and most of his uh, works are very self-referential. He always cites himself or alludes to other things he wrote. So uh, political theology actually should be uh, read together with two other books by Schmidt, which are um, Roman Catholicism and Political Form, mm. and uh, Political Theology Two, which was uh, released, uh, which was published in 1970 uh, as, a, as a response to a Catholic um, theo uh, th theologist who critiqued Schmidt's critique of political theology. Uh, but since we're, doing some 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 uh, let's say uh, introductory uh, steps here <laughs> this this is of course nothing that uh, we could achieve because uh, it is also more about uh, today's um, significance of Schmidt as I believe that was uh, your main intention Tyler so uh, yeah I believe we could get into it if you guys have nothing to add yeah, that was a really great introduction. Um, that's that's why we have you here. So I appreciate that. So let's jump right into it. Um, so the first point of discussion for the significance of Schmidt, Schmidt is I actually wanted to start the conversation with the idea of political theology. 
Because I think most discussions of Schmidt that I see in the distant right, they tend to focus more on the problem of sovereignty, the ideas of the friend-enemy distinction, and his explicit critiques of liberalism, but not so much one of his core ideas. And that's the theological side of political theology. And by this, I mean Schmidt's claim that all political philosophy is at its core political theology. And it's not just a method or genealogy of how political concepts have came about historically with their genesis in religion, but it's also a mode of political production, a recognition of the theological nature of all human activities. So Schmidt tells another narrative, and there's many narratives about what went wrong with the Enlightenment, of course, but Schmidt tells another narrative akin to the Nietzschean one of the death of God that we talked about in our last stream, where Schmidt points to its transformation into the Cartesian God in the 17th century, the God who acts and creates to its gradual decline to the deist God in the Enlightenment. So the state took on the role of the active creative God that brings order to chaos, while the god of deism that would emerge from the rationalism of the Enlightenment is the one that creates the universe and establishes natural laws and backs off from his creation. And he's unable to intervene in his own established system. So that would become akin to the rule of law and constitution of the deferral of the sovereign to the law. And Schmidt presents this gradual immitization of the sovereign from creating out of nothing and intervening into chaos to its decline with deism down to the you know, Rousseau's reappropriation of the sovereign into the general world of the people, which is a, a move away from decisive political power from above. So this story of the decline of the creative power of the sovereign into the liberal state, whereby the sovereign is restricted to conditions outlined in law, is a danger for Schmidt because the liberal state and its laws can't predict a future crisis as it's modeled on deism, where there's a rationalist understanding of the universe that's open to that's open to prediction. It's controlled by a set of universal, timeless laws that you approach by a universalizing reason. So this creates, and you, you approach that a priori, of course, and this creates the dominance of chaos in times of crisis that the law is unable to answer for, and power is not able to intervene effectively. So the important point here is not just the critique of the liberal state that we all often make to account for this crisis that we live in, but it's also that there's this theological understanding that precedes the political or goes along with it, and that there's always this sense of the sacred at the center of politics. And Schmidt calls for embracing a form of ancient theology with its focus on creation ex nihilo, which is the idea of creating out of nothing, like in Genesis, there was nothing and God spoke order. And so he's not returning to a reactionary point where he's trying to go back to some ideal time in the past, but he's advocating that creation ex nihilo as a creation of enough, out of nothing. And this can't be done without theology. So starting with the UFC and then Richard, what do you, how do you conceive of this sense of the theological in Schmidt, Schmidt's work? Um, yeah, I mean, that was a nice, that was a kind of nice introduction into a political theology. I, I guess to simplify it and take it back a step, you know, uh, he, he starts that third chapter, which, I, which is the one that the, the text is named after, is named after a phrase in that essay with the, with the phrase, you know, the idea of the constitutional state triumphed together with deism. And mm -hmm. what he's essentially saying there is that uh, the the rise of deism, which he says banished the miracle from the world, banished the idea, you know, banished the idea of the Christian miracle, banished the idea of the resurrection, which obviously is central to Christianity, uh, also coincided, as it were, with the banishment of the sovereign decision and of the exception. Uh, Enlightenment philosophy was based on uh, an entirely rationalistic system, which was, you know, pushed through and, and echoed throughout nature, throughout the state. Uh, so the world, the world was one driven by natural laws. These natural laws uh, were, ne were never uh, superseded. They were never suspended. And in a way, you know, the, the state, the, the normal state, the perfect state, the constitutional state in the liberal mind should parallel this. You know, once you set up the perfect constitution with the perfect laws, uh, that's it, as it were. The laws take over, 
The laws kind of know when to suspend themselves. They know how to modify themselves. There's no need for a, uh, an omnipotent lawmaker to come in and produce, as it were, a kind of miracle. Uh, so the state echoes the deist's created universe. Once it's established, there are no exceptional suspensions of natural law or of the constitutional legal order. The problem, Schmidt says, is that uh, you know exceptions are kind of happening all the time. Uh, that's something that liberals can neither account for nor can their laws really. Uh, the political salvation of man lies not in abstract systems of metaphysics for someone like Schmidt, nor yet in the rationalist conception of this all-encompassing rule of law, a Rechtsstaat, which can never be suspended. Uh, he brings up uh, Donoso Cortez, of whom he was a, a great admirer, who's, who's a, a Spanish ultramontanist thinker of the, of the 19th century. And Cortez basically said that uh, it, was the it was in the miracle of the resurrection and the authority of the Pope that humanity had to seek its, its soul and its political salvation. If you, if you secularize that thought, as uh, Schmidt was doing, uh, the, the situation is really no different. Our ultimate survival doesn't depend on some perfect, unimpeachable constitutional legal order, but the capacity of a sovereign decider to deal with whatever is going to come up, to deal with the exception uh, in an effective and a productive way. You could say by way of what we would theologically think of as a miracle. Yeah, jump in, Richard. Oh, sure. Yeah, I, I uh, agree with uh, most everything that's been said. Um, I, I think a, maybe a good starting point for um, for our audience to start thinking about Schmidt is, is the problems of the American constitutional order. And um, here, I'm not just talking about the Constitution, but I, I think it's, it's worth talking about the Declaration of Independence. Uh, by Thomas Jefferson, which uh, you know does does not found a state, but but kind of founds the again secularized theology of the state. It it, it offers a, a, a it offers a kind of sacredness uh, to what America is going to be about, and at that time it it was a different kind of nation state. Many people in the dissident right. Um, you know, take umbrage with uh, the famous words of, you know, all men are created equal. We hold this to be self-evident. And we say, oh, no, of course, that's not true. Jefferson himself didn't believe it. And I, my IQ differences and so on. And, and, I, and I don't disagree with any of that. Uh, but I, I think in, in terms of the problem of America, it, it, that all men are created equal is it, not actually the, the, the greatest fault. I, I think the greater fault is in his the story he tells about how the state uh, comes about. Uh, and the story Jefferson tells effectively is that we have these rights, there are these universal laws, and then um, because we can't fully enforce them ourselves, we create a state in order to justify the laws. And in a way, law comes first. I mean, it's classic liberalism. It's the liberal, the ultimate liberal fallacy. There are these universal laws come first, and then we have to reluctantly create a police force and a military and et cetera to maintain these uh, rights that were given to us uh, by God. Uh, that also, mu much like Jefferson didn't actually believe, if you judge him by his actions and not his words, didn't actually believe that all men are created equal. He didn't actually believe in this story that he tells in the Declaration of Independence as well. Uh, America was ultimately founded by a military revolt against a just uh, sovereign leadership of the colonies. And if those men who were undoubtedly brave uh, failed, they would have been executed and had their property uh, uh, taken away from them. And it would have been done legally and justly and with legitimacy. So at the heart of America is a kind of exception, you could say. At the heart of America is this violent act of asserting authority, one that w they would never allow to be reproduced, uh, whether it's the Whiskey Rebellion or the Civil War or anything like that. Uh, they 
violently, they exceptionally violently opposed um, the, you know, uh, legalistic order that they were under, uh, and they would not allow it to happen again. It was the, uh, you know, for me, but not for thee, the ultimate state of exception. And I don't say that in the slightest bit as a criticism. Um, that is how the state is form formed. It is it, it, there is a irrational, you could say irrational, violent origin of it, and this goes against the you know the fundamental, foundational problem of liberalism, which is based on contracts and ratios. Of you know, it would be better for me. I'll, I'll sign this contract because it would be better for me to enter into an engagement with the state because it will protect my rights or something like that. That's that's not how uh, the state is founded. Um, so I, I would say that I, I think the the other thing there there are two basic aphorisms from. Uh, the uh, political theology and 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 probably the two which contains probably the two most famous and maybe most important aphorisms in in Schmidt's work. The first one is the first uh, line of the book: um, "The the sovereign is he who decides on the exception." Um, and we can think about that. I mean, I I, I of, of course don't disagree with the the way it's been described uh, now, but but we can think about all of that as well in the way that the rubber hits the road, in the sense that. Uh, we have a functioning bureaucratic technological government that is, you know, petering on down the road. Uh, we pay our taxes. Uh, the, we pay our tar parking tickets. Uh, technocrats do whatever they do uh, on their computers every day and so on. But there are these moments of exception in which the sovereign is declared. I cannot you know, uh, experience a state of exception in my own life uh, when I go around uh, like a vigilante and start arresting people I don't like. As much as I would like to do that, um, I am not Batman. Um, and I, I actually think the comic book aspect of this is um, uh, something that that's, it's fun to talk about, but it's, it's actually something that is serious to talk about. Um, I don't have that ability to do what the state can do. The state can go to war and maintain its legitimacy, even if it loses, even if it does things that are ghastly. Uh, the government can ultimately declare a state of exception. The president himself, uh, with or without Congress, uh, can launch actions that kill hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions. The state could quarantine if this, you know, uh, uh, Corona epidemic gets out of hand, the state could quarantine, uh, suspend regular normal law and order in order to protect itself. And so this is where the, the rubber hits the road. Now, the other aphorism, the second aphorism that is, is most famous and, and maybe most important in Schmidt's work uh, is the concept of political theology. And, and that is that, uh, you know, theories of the state are, are effectively secularized theological concepts or something to that effect. Um, and that is a question of legitimacy. So it is basically how does this, how is the state able to be exceptional? It, it, it's a question of pure power at some level, like Mao's, you know, infamous, uh, perhaps apocryphal comment of, you know, the sovereignty comes from the point of a gun. Well, that's not wrong, but that's also not entirely true. Uh, it, it is, you, you can't just uh, brandish weapons at citizens and other people and, and, and expect to have a state that will last some time. No, there, there actually is a, there's a legitimacy to the state that's in our hearts and minds and that is deeply important to us. And so the state does become, not, not, only, not only are our theories of it, um, you know, secularized theology, but the state also becomes like God. We we participate in the political process like we're participating in a religion, and and I think so much of polarization right now actually does derive from, you know, polarization in the American context, and it's um, similar in, in other European contexts. Does derive from two different theological theological s conceptions of what America and democracy actually mean. Uh, so again, I, I think sometimes, you know, Schmidt is 
falsely characterized as a, you know, philosopher of power and, you know, friend and enemy distinction, you know, it, it, it's mano a mano, you know, we're, we're going to fight to the death. And, and that's, that's a part of Schmidt. But I think what makes Schmidt the uh, genius and indispensable thinker that he is, is that that is balanced dialectically with his uh, you know, you could say philosophical, theological, or even you could say even emotional or psychological. And I could go into the psychological elements a little bit later, but psychological understandings of the legitimacy of the state. <clears throat> well, I'll leave was, it at that. That was really well said. Um, anyone want to respond to that? Um, I would like to add uh, that uh, you, you already talked about uh, the legitimacy problem. And um, the, as with many writings of Schmidt, uh, political theology in and of itself is not really about theology. Uh, it, it makes use of theology and the analysis and critique of, uh, of the, the decline of uh, theology within the transition from uh, monarchies to uh, constitutional democracies and, and stuff like that. But uh, it's actually mainly a, uh, a, 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 a diatribe against liberalism and a, an attempt to clarify what is sovereignty in a constitutional and a jurisdictional uh, sense of the word. And, uh, the one of the main critiques of, of many critiques uh, against liberalism he brings forward is that in liberal constitutional states, um, the political is slowly depersonalized. Mm -hmm. Liberal regimes try to depersonalize and to depoliticize politics by mm -hmm. uh, by, by uh, shifting it from concrete uh, persons and institutions and uh, to uh, parliaments who are uh, loaded with uh, responsibility to, to, uh, to, to, to speak the unified will of a large population and stuff like that. And uh, Schmidt, uh, Schmidt analyzes all these processes with a with a very with a very theoretical and uh, sometimes even a bit dry and and uh, and and uh, juridical train of thought but uh, there are there are very very uh, poignant uh, poignant pieces he picks out and concentrates on and re with regards to the US and uh, the 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 becoming of the U.S. as a as a federation, as a as a union, <laughs> sorry, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah. the 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 uh, the Declaration of Independence and the U.S. Constitution. Uh, he he even uh, uses Alexis de Tocqueville's writing on the democracy in America as a prime example of uh, this this attempt of liberalism to depersonalize, but also not openly depersonalize politics in uh, that he says uh, that uh, there that there is a certain uh, residual in the US of personalized politics because the founding fathers and the people who wrote the US constitution uh, kind of uh, memed into existence the belief that the word of the people we the people solemnly declare and, and so on and so forth, that the word of the people was the word of God. And so mm. the, the Declaration of Independence and uh, the US Constitution are more or less uh, the secularized Ten Commandments which apply to the US populace. Right. Um, that is one of the, one of the parts of uh, uh, secularized political theology which uh, apply to the US only in, in this uh, special occasion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there, there's something I, I agree with that, but there's something I slightly want to push back on as well when I mentioned at the beginning the importance of theology as theology in Schmidt's conception. Because what Richard rightly talked about, for example, you have, you have the American Constitution, you have lines like all men are created equal, but then you also have this military power that is the real power that enforces this, enforces this narrative, right? And that, that, that mythology of the state is what gives it 
its legitimacy, right? So you take a look at the American political philosophers that are considered canon to American mythology. Look at like John Rawls, for example, The Veil of Ignorance. You have these individuals preceding society and that if they were abstracted from the condition, they would come to the same ontological ideas about justice, right? As the American mythology just happens to do. And Schmidt tells a story of decline from Cartesianism before that ain't medieval theology to Cartesianism to deism as he seems to be saying that there's a proceeding of theological ideas about what is sacred and about who we are and that's what gives birth to this political antagonism and liberalism where you have for example if you take a look right now you take a look between uh, certain ideas that democrats and neoliberals have versus neoconservatives have neoconservatives they take this ideal of military power spreading democracy and safety for the American unilateral order all around the world. But at the same time, then you have the Democrats saying things like, okay, well, all of our ideas about freedom and liberty that you know they use as justification for their policies and policies that we could say are, for example, are anti-white or whatever, which they certainly are. But they're, they're saying these are an outgrowth of American ideas of a secular neutrality, of the space of freedom right. where you get to you know, enact your individualism. And right. so you get this antagonism between these ideals of freedom, this, this secular theology, this version of Christianity where it removes the apocalyptic dimension of Christian theology and brings about a deistic conception in the space of freedom. And that conflicts with the need for military sovereignty that the neoconservatives are definitely getting at. And you get this antagonism within the American empire and these two modes of what the American empire is. Is it this bastion of freedom and liberty and enlightenment for the world? Or is it this terrible thing bringing destruction and homogeneity around the world? And both mm -hmm. of those are certainly true, but you're seeing this, can, you're seeing this antagonism show up between liberal theology and American military power that's needed to sustain it. You're, you're seeing this intrusion of the real into the mythology. And that came about from this construction of the secular neutral space, this idea of your own religious ideas about what is good and what is just become abstracted from this dimension of the secular in which you're supposed to put aside those beliefs and enter the space where with the power of universal reason, we can say, convince people that abortion is wrong or gay marriage is wrong or you're supposed to translate it into the secular secular language, which is to say there's a primacy of this secular theology that is what the American empire functions on. And as I was saying, this antagonism between its institutions, which need coercion and dominance and subserving the individual and nations around the world in order to maintain it. So the theological problem I see for me is that this is predicated on what is truly sacred and who we are is what gets down to the end of but I see the importance of the use of theology in this context. I understand, for example, cr critic, theological critics of Schmidt tend to put theopolitics as opposed to political theology, but uh, what would you say to my rejoinder there, Nils? Um, I believe that's right. Um, Schmidt, mm, Schmidt makes the, the valid point that without a person Without personalized politics, whether it's about a king or a, 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 a god emperor or what have you, or some 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 uh, some aristocratic uh, council like the uh, Priaconta in in ancient Athens, um, there it, it politics is politics become the political not politics there there is a valid distinction to be made the political becomes depoliticized when there is no one to make a decision uh political theology is a is a writing of schmitz from his decisionist phase um and he states in his as his, as his main point of critique against this the the personalization and uh, the the downfall the the slow uh decay of th theological uh, political thinking into metaphysical political thinking then moralistic political thinking humanistic political thinking and at the very end economic political thinking as uh, he was able to see it in uh, both socialism and uh, the sort of radical liberalism that uh, european uh, 
conservatives saw in the U.S. at at uh, the uh, within the interwar period. Um, all of this uh, gets people and gets especially the state away from being able to make a decision. And there we get into the the metaphysical meaning of the exception because Schmidt parallelizes the exception to the miracle because. Uh, both events uh, are defined by th there not being any norms which would uh, provide a guidance how to handle the situation. Uh, nowadays, we're used to uh, immediately think of a war or some uh, terrorist attack or uh, a, a natural disaster when we hear exception, the state of exception and political exceptions and stuff like that. But uh, Schmidt gets gets uh, to the, the fundamentals of it. And he just he says it's it's something completely it's, it's otherness entering a certain sphere, a certain world mm -hmm. in, within the miracle, which is actually not a uh, theological term, uh, within the miracle, uh, the divine enters the human world. Whereas in the exception, uh, the, the, the existential enters the codified jurisdictional uh, world of usual normal state politics. And uh, both events shake this order. Sometimes they break this order. And uh, a decision must be made to prevent the, 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 the subjects of the former order from falling back into the national state, which is uh, because Schmidt was largely uh, influenced by Thomas Hobbes, which is the uh, bellum omnium contra omnes. So uh, the, the natural state of man as uh, another man's wolf, where people just uh, slaughter one another for uh, clean water and food and stuff like that. Uh, it's it's a matter of it's it's a matter of survival and a matter of existence and so uh, Richard was definitely right by pointing out some of the many misconceptions uh, people nowadays have about Schmidt in all of his different phases of writing and uh, in the interwar period and after World War II and in whatever uh, let's say political mood he was in he always at the very at, at the very base was a political existentialist. It was always about the, mm -hmm. the, 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 <clears throat> the, about survival and, and the, the, the existence of the state in and of itself. And uh, within this work, this, his body of work, he was at different points of time uh, influenced to various degrees by his main three, uh, fundamental viewpoints as being a Catholic, as being a German nationalist, and as being a statist. So mm -hmm. <laughs> there should pretty much be uh, something in the mix for everyone on the right, except for libertarians, <laughs> maybe. But that's that's one more reason to like Schmidt, actually. <laughs> yeah. I think if I may interject, uh, I think the we're going to talk about the relationship between theology and the political. Schmidt makes the point that in the chapter in which he really inquires, I think the third chapter is where he really kind of covers this most comprehensively uh, from memory. He talks about um, the sociology of political concepts, which is what he's doing. He's saying we need to understand the metaphysical and theological beliefs of a people at a certain time to understand the basis through which they process political ideas. And out of that, we understand how they actually interact with the political because theology is fundamentally the inquiry into what is sacred and uh, metaphysics into what is true, what is just, what is moral. And so if we understand how people inquire into these things, then, you know, that's going to reflect itself in its political institutions. So Schmidt makes the point that when you have a kind of theistic uh, paradigm, the divine right of kings and a kind of and Christendom in a kind of normal state, uh, you know, uh, before the Enlightenment, um, the ontological category of the revelatory, what he calls the miracle, is preserved in the Christian theological understanding. So what this means is, you know, in the Christian theological understanding, there are a set of rules governing how reality works, uh, what God has spoken into existence, like the scholastics talked about this. Um, truth is for the scholastics, 
a set of declarations made by God that we come into an understanding of. But there is also the capacity for God to act in the world, for God to come down into the world and, and, and show something new, say something new. That's why there's the necessity in for, for prophets and spirituality and this genuine interaction with divinity. And so this legislates, or sorry, legitimizes, I should say, sovereignty to actually act in the world. Because if, you know, if God can show new things to us, that means that the truths aren't already understood based upon some set of dogmas and established ways of understanding that have already been detailed. There's actually a live, interactive, participatory aspect to what is true and legitimate and right. And so that authorizes monarchy. But then when you get the rise of you know, the Freemasons and deism, um, this notion that God is just the divine architect, he's set the world into motion, um, set up a, a set of universal laws, the laws of physics, etc., uh, and that's it. He just steps back and everything plays out and, and God no longer interacts in the world. Uh, the ontological category of the revelatory is now removed from the theological uh, and therefore kind of metaphysical understanding of the participants. And so now it becomes problematic for there to be a, a sovereign that comes in and actually makes decisions. Uh, because, wait a second, we need to measure the truth of what you're saying based upon some eternal set of, of static propositions that God brought into being with the origin of the universe. And so this sets the ball rolling to the problematization of um, someone actually making a decision and having the authority to do so at the top of the political process. And so you get, you know, with the American Constitution, um, you know, rights are given to us by our creator, supposedly at the beginning of time or something. They're eternal, they're self-evident. And so there's no space under which someone can come along and say, well, maybe we should change this right or we should change mm. this law or do this and violate these rights. That's it. This is the rules and that there is no space for the revelatory remaining. Um, then as you get the progression of modernity with, uh, you know, deism becomes atheism, basically God gets completely cut out and you just have it, the laws of nature essentially suspended uh, with no origin. Um, and but that so if you look at like the Declaration of Independence, the American Constitution, and then and then compare that to something like the UN Declaration of Human Rights, the UN Declaration of Human Rights, written around I think the end of the Second World War, there's no mention of God. Uh, these rights just somehow exist. They're just and, and they've invented all these new ones as well. So now you've got the right to healthcare, I think, and you've got all these new. There's like so many more. Um, so I don't know who like someone just decided apparently, but they're always true. These things are self-evident. Um, and so this is the situation you get into with liberalism, where by removing the capacity for someone to actually decide upon what is sacred, you create this perpetual conversation or discussion that is supposed to have no actual conclusion. No one ever gets legislated by the discussion to finally to say, this is what's valuable. This is what's important. This is how society should be ordered. Instead, we just have this perpetual inquiry. But this goes along quite nicely with the, um, you know, what you get in modernity through Cartesian and Kantian metaphysics, where you get this transcendental subjectivity, this transcendental individual that can somehow exist outside of society and culture and come to rational evaluations about the world. And what that individual is supposed to do under liberalism is eventually realize that liberalism is correct. And so... Because it was apparently if you just sit there and you rationally inquire like a good Kantian right. into morality, you, you realize that we need to have all of these liberal standards and so forth. And so um, this kind of perpetual discussionism conceals that a decision actually has been made by the liberal order, that we're going to be liberal and we're going to have mm -hmm. freedom of speech and academic freedom. And we're going to have all of these things that we actually believe in, but we're going to pretend like this decision hasn't been made and create a perpetual discussion where you can talk about any other non-liberal idea you like, but you can't actually apply it. Um, because we can only have liberalism because otherwise we wouldn't be free to think differently, you know? Um, so that's that's the kind of residual, I think, basis from which we understand why I think Schmidt's so interesting and significant and why I consider him to be a kind of the first genuinely post-liberal thinker in certain ways, because mm. he excavates this idea of what he calls decisionism, this idea that sovereignty has to act in the world independent of pre-established ways of understanding and this distinction he makes between the declarative propositions of 
dogmas, a set of already established metaphysical understandings and actually engaging with being the kind of direct ostensive imperative world in which there's a problem right before us, the state of exception. We don't know exactly, uh, we, don't, we haven't already got a pre-given set of laws and, and, and regulations and institutions that know what to do about this. I have to step in and make a decision, point. This is what's important. This is what we need to do next. That's real sovereignty. And Schmidt is saying this needs to be understood at the center and origin of the political process. But what liberals do is try and completely remove through sleight of hand and different intellectual confusions that this is even a thing. There's just these right. eternal rules that are suspended, uh, uh, you know, somehow they have no origin uh, that, you know, the liberal jurist or, uh, you know, Kantian, neo-Kantian theorists or whatever can, can come into understanding through rational inquiry and then those things govern everything. So the like ANCAPs are kind of vulgarized version of this one. The NAP is like this like transcendental metaphysical, um, uh, you know. Universally preferable. Being. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. This is what, you know, a, a yeah. super sovereign construct, a reified abstraction, right. has no origin, governs everything, and all we need to do is just perpetually inquire into it, and then we can determine everything that we need to do. But of course, as a kind of segue to the next topic, Schmidt problematizes this by pointing out, well, okay, so who gets to decide how to interpret it? Right. How exactly are we supposed to figure out who's in charge of deciding whether this abstraction means this, that, or the other thing? Uh, that's the political contest and ultimately that ends up leaving kind of open the idea okay what's well, all well and good if you think xyz is true and should be the way things are but how do things actually become enforced and this is the problem of sovereignty yeah just to add um one little bit to this conversation um you know schmidt was a member of max weber's circle um, and he was influenced by uh, this thinker who, who was fundamentally uh, liberal, certainly a, a, a great thinker. And uh, I, I think one of the aspects of, of Weber that, that, that influenced Schmidt um, mostly was the, uh, the, the, the concept of the Protestant work ethic and the rise of capitalism, which is something that I think actually uh, um, many people in our circles have, have, have at least heard of. Um, and the, I, I think the what's interesting about that that conception is that it it was you know theological it was religious uh, and it was in the strict sense of the word and it was um, psychological as well and so if you listen to the kind of Protestant critique of Catholicism it's this critique of the formality of it all. Of you know why are we paying these indulgences? You know faith alone is is how we are saved, and uh, why are why are we taking money and building these elaborate uh, pagan churches? You know we should have little uh, neighborhood uh, um, places where we read the text uh, together and so on. And so they wanted to get away from the strictness, you could say, or or, or formality, the outward formality of the religion. Uh, but ironically, what they they ultimately achieved was this unbelievably rigid, much more formal psychology. And so it was re replacing the kind of outward form of religion, uh, as well as those those aspects of, of Catholicism that, that we've discussed before, the 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 incarnation, the come, you know, the God coming into the world, uh, authority, uh, etc., uh, and they kind of replaced it in themselves, and they became, you know, a entirely rigid, strict, formalist, gray on gray worker bees. Um, and while they were doing that, this was this this psychologicalization of the formality of of Christianity was leading to the de secularization, the, the secularization, the de sacredness of the world. Uh, and of the state itself to the point where, you know, you reach deism and so on. And we're just individuals kind of operating together, attempting to profit uh, from one another, um, obeying, uh, you know, you know self-evident and, and, and thus never uh, interrogated ideas like the non-aggression principle um, or, or, or so on, living in this order together. Uh, it, it was the kind of de, you know, the, the, the 
the the the secularization of the world the the pulling god out of the world the uh, iconoclasm and so on it was it was pulling the uh, uh, the, the, de the decision, the sacredness out of the state. Uh, it, it was making a life, this, this you know, kind of this bringing it all into the person uh, in, in which we are a, a rigid, rational individual. Uh, and I, I think that's a, you know, an important background for, uh, for all of this discussion of both, both theology and, and just religion itself. I mean, it, Schmidt was a Catholic, <laughs> um, you know, at the end of the day, he was, uh, I guess you could make the joke that he was a Catholic, but maybe not a Christian or um, uh, a, a Catholic with pagan elements. But uh, but the, but that is a, 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 a indispensable aspect of his thought. Let me uh, let me just jump in because you brought up the link. I think it's an interesting one between Schmidt and and Weber. Another thing he takes out of Weber, which is interesting, which hasn't yet been kind of touched on, is is Weber's breakdown. Let's not say of different uh, different personalities or psychological types, but kind of different social types. He Weber has these essays where he deconstructs really what it essentially is to be a bureaucrat or a modern politician, a general, mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. And um, one way you can look at the second essay, which Nils I think intimated is kind of the most uh, the, the hardest to get into or the most uh, formulaic. Uh, the most the most obsessed with legal theory is that Schmidt there is he, he kind of begins by deconstructing several liberal theories of sovereignty by his contemporaries and it links up in chapter four to show why there is a there is always a necessity for decision for decisionism but particularly you know if you want to think about it more concretely of graceful leadership um, it, you know in in that, in that second chapter he basically says that whether one has in mind the rule of law, in, in that case he's thinking about uh, two of his contemporaries, Kelsen and Crabbe, uh, or whether you have this more popular conception of sovereignty relying on the will of the people. You know, if you think about Rousseau's general will or something like that, you'll have the same problem. Uh, whatever kind of liberal you are here, whatever kind of liberal theorist, you're demanding this concept of objectivity to come out of the process, to come out of politics, uh, that never ends up emerging uh, because essentially all of these liberal theorists or democratic theorists, they want to, they want to eliminate this, this cluster concept of the exception, the decision, and therefore the necessity of command. Uh, they want to, they want to get rid of the personal from the concept mm -hmm. of the state. And, uh, you know, in failing to see their own enlightenment ontology and actually failing to criticize that, uh, this all kind of falls apart. As we know now, you know, most anthropologists would agree that whatever antecedents there are to modern political power basically are personal. You know, if you think about, if you think about what comes before, uh, if you think about what comes before presidents, kings, popes, and so on, you basically have a kind of chief, a village strongman, just someone who, uh, you know, someone who can certainly declare on the meaning of things, not just someone who decides the exception, but who actually opens a space uh, in which, you know, people can productively uh, engage. You know, this is why he brings up Hobbes. I think it's the first time he uses the word, but he calls Hobbes a decisionist because he's, he saw that Hobbes, Hobbes kind of elevated this necessity for the concrete decision and said that it always emanated from a particular authority uh, and, and Schmidt believes an unavoidably personal one. Then in the fourth chapter, he kind of moves, he, he moves from these liberals basically to the, uh, to, to the people who stand in some way opposite to them, uh, Catholic uh, counter-revolutionaries and, and, and reactionaries, Demetre Cortez, um, in saying that, look, one way of saying it, one way of putting across what he's saying here is that the 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 entrance of the bourgeoisie into politics uh, has essentially denuded it and mm -hmm. uh, and you know introduced all of this confusion because all the bourgeoisie are really good at doing and they are excellent at doing it is discussing things endlessly. Uh, there's you know among the bourgeoisie there is a there is a kind of 
fear of others who would step into the position of political rule, but in a way they don't even trust themselves to step up and provide graceful leadership. Right. <laughs> they, just, they just kind of want to discuss things to the end of time. Uh, where, I mean, I, I, he, quotes, uh, he quotes Cortez. I think Cortez is an interesting writer for people who want to get into this kind of stuff. Uh, because I think Cortez hits the nail on the head when he says that, you know, a class that shifts all political activity onto the plane of conversation in parliament and in university and so on, it, it's no match for social conflict, ultimately. I mean, it's kind of waiting for someone to come along and replace it. Um, he he brings, you know, in, in contrast to that, he's kind of, in that last chapter, he's discussing essentially why making a decision is much more important than how a decision is made. And what's characteristic of our time is that no one wants to make one, or I think truer, truer to form, no one wants to be seen to make a decision. Uh, yeah. but, but, but the necessity for a decision keeps occurring. It's just hard to track who's making it, and it's hard to hold them responsible for it. Yeah, I mean, in, in the age of neutralization, uh, the, the catchphrase is, no one is above the law. You hear this from conservatives and liberals, and, and all they are doing at some level is abdicating responsibility for making the exceptional decision in the hour of decision. Uh, to a point that, I mean, th this will at some point be the crisis of the state itself uh, when there will be no person or entity that will ultimately take responsibility for the future. And um, yeah, I mean, uh, th th I think I think this is th this is that. And, and I think that would be a kind of point of no return. There's also, I think, a point I wanted to reemphasize, which is that Schmidt kind of subtext, I think, that goes through all the works that I've read by him is, th is this idea that I very deeply agree with, which is that there's a very fundamental equivalence between divinity and sovereignty, that what it means for something to be, let me rephrase that, the very center of our conception of what is sacred, what is true, is either, pick a poison, either a, someone that, that is, you know, some kind of earthly authority, like a priest, a, a president, um, some kind of leader that commands on behalf of some political identity, some kind of conception of the sacred, or a kind of personalization or conceptualization of the sacred itself. There's something that gives us the authority with which to say, this is good, this is bad, this should be done, this shouldn't be done, this ought to be, this ought not to be. And so there's, there's a very like fundamental equivalence between divinity and uh, sovereignty. And so you get mm. with this rejection of divinity at the same time, a rejection of sovereignty. So this hyper atheistic trajectory in society uh, has ultimately been a denial of sovereignty actually being a thing. You get with, mm -hmm. um, like you, that's what we, where we're at with modernity uh, basically, because that's the very ontology of this making a decision you don't make a decision uh, out of nothing. You make a decision inspired. What are you inspired by? Mm -hmm. You're inspired by divinity. And so the way that divinity actually comes into the world in a revelatory way is through someone making an inspired decision that, that something is before us, confronting us, that problematizes the way things are and something needs to be done about it. This provocation of the divine and participation in its realization, that's sovereignty. That's what it really means. And I think that basic fundamental idea, I think, shrouds why we've gone down the trajectory of liberalism, because with Christianity, you get this alienation of the divine where divinity isn't something, is is, is kind of removed from mm -hmm. direct uh, experience through, there's, there's a priesthood, there's a set of dogmas and, and the, theological kind of constructs that shroud what it means for God to exist. When you look at so many attempts by various um, theological schools throughout history to say, well, don't, don't worry about how God shows himself to you or about your participation in being. God is these set of dogmas and a bunch of nerds inquiring into scripture endlessly. This is what this is what divinity actually is. Um, and and so we've been, that's, that's why I make this point of the priest versus the shaman. We need this shamanic ontology, this understanding of divinity as something you participate in and you realize directly because that's mm -hmm. the grounding from which we can actually understand sovereignty correctly. And, uh, and so 
once you kind of abstract the divine away in one way or alienate ourselves from this imminent participation in, in divinity realizing itself, then you just start this historical ball rolling where um, it just gets further and further abstracted. More priests would set up more alienations to the point where sovereignty and divinity are denied as even having any kind of realness at all. I think with re with respect to the modern era, the trend that you just brought up is 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 the reason why Schmidt certainly, but also other thinkers are are interested in these these instances of what you might call revolutionary, but definitely graceful leadership in the context of the you know after the breakdown of Christianity. I mean, in one way, if you look at someone like Napoleon, who is certainly a graceful leader, uh, he whether or not he had Christian faith. I mean, it certainly, I mean, he was a man of his times. Uh, he certainly wasn't a devout Christian uh, in the 20th century. If you look at the truly consequential political names, Hitler, uh, Stalin, FDR are probably some of the most consequential, the top three perhaps. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, none of them were Christians in particular, but certainly they were inspired by something. Uh, and certainly they, they had this capacity for graceful leadership. Uh, so it, it, it's weird. I mean, Schmidt, Schmidt one, one way of proceeding with Schmidt is kind of um, unearthing, uh, you know, unearthing the subterranean, the, you know, the buried grounds of, uh, of possible inspiration, even after a time when we've basically lost Christian faith. Yeah, th this goes back to what I was saying earlier. That I'm glad uh, Joel brought up the uh, the point about the divine, the shamanic ontology. Because when I was crossing uh, the idea of political theology as using sociological concept, which is certainly true, but my rejoinder to that was that I'm trying to move past critique into a productive understanding that if we're to renew uh, a, a direction for the dissident right when it comes to actually what it means going forward and to take power is that we need to, we can't separate philosophy and political theory and theology from each other, but we need to have a renewed sense of what the sacred is going forward. And that is ultimately a productive act, which we have to work in to figure out what exactly, how we're going to renew the sacred in our time going forward. So that's what I was trying to get at is that we can't strictly talk about it sociologically, but we need to move towards a productive act for the right going forward, but we can't do that merely logistically or merely with critique, but rather with a productive sense of the sacred. Um, if anyone has anywhere to go from this, because uh, we're already an hour in and we have not moved past the first discussion question. <laughs> so um, if anyone wants to move it from there, because um, the second question, we were going to take up sovereignty as a state of exception. We're going to have FC take us through that. but. We could just move along to questions because we're only supposed to go an hour and a half and we're already an hour in. Uh, FC, did you want to move on to sovereignty and state of exception? Or we could I, I, cover yeah. it to a, to a we large did. degree. But, we did. Yeah. I was going to say, I mean, maybe not directly, but we, we mm -hmm. kind of got there. Uh, maybe maybe if you want, we, we can all kind of give a, a little something on, on how we think Schmidt applies today or, or one way to take mm. things forward in a in a particularly practical sense and then move on to questions yeah because that was the next thing after the second mm. discussion question yeah. so let's move right into that um starting with richard and then joel i know you had something about deluge that you wanted to bring up as well mm -hmm. so yeah uh, start with you richard well i i think the major way in which schmidt is relevant uh, which he achieves, you know, actualitate the, you know, excellent German word for uh, relevance and actuality, rubber hitting road, a metaphor I like to use, um, is with the neutralization of the world as as the ultimate threat to to state sovereignty, and and you could even say the the ultimate threat to the the, the sacred itself and and life being uh, worth living. Uh, and and this is the the end of history as as Fukuyama or Kojev uh, defined it. It is the notion that you know it, exceptionality is gone. Uh, not you know in in the sense of there there's no reason to have war anymore. There's no reason to have a real political conflict. Uh, there are no friends. 
uh, there are no enemies, but also in a way there there are no friends. The 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 political has evaporated, and that is we are all uh, individuals on this planet uh, using rational calculation to determine profits and happiness, and we would never even think of aggressing against each other. And perhaps there should be a kind of global police force because there are these few rotten apples in the batch who might engage in crime or, or so on, uh, whether we call that terrorism or whether it's you know crime in, in the normal uh, sense. Uh, but we will have uh, one world order. And there is a, you know, in, to use a Leninist term, a kind of withering away of the state in the sense that there is no real reason for the state as it was uh, conceived in Schmidt's time or, or uh, historical. There is no no entity that will have absolute power. That is a kind of rogue state, uh, as the United States likes to um, uh, uh, term it. And so the United States is this kind of funny, contradictory entity that is going to have to it, that is attempting um, quite diligently to it in to enforce this McDonald'sization, you know, globalization of the planet, but which has to always rely on hard power. And you could say, you know, the the older forms of empire in which to do it. Uh, I, I there was a uh, very interesting, um, you know, political scandal that happened recently in which uh, after the uh, assassination of Soleimani, a, a uh, you know, quite highly well-respected Iranian general um, who would occasionally um, uh, collaborate with the United States and then was labeled a terrorist uh, uh, the next day in that usual way that Washington does, uh, in, in which uh, after his assassination, um, the I Iraqi parliament, which was, you know, established for, you know, the good of all mankind and the uh, universal value of female liberation and Muslims uh, getting an undergraduate degree and all of these things that we know are self-evidently good. Um, and uh, basically, Washington just had to say no at some level. Um, you actually don't have this power. Uh, we are your imperial overlord, even though we don't like to use that terminology. Uh, and so the the crisis of America is going to be a, a, a fairly unique crisis. I, I'm not sure this is exactly something we've seen before, although, of course, there are some precedents. Uh, but it is that um, enforcement of McDonaldization. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the can there be a total neutralization uh, of politics done by a state and done by a state as well that has to at least be influenced by uh, domestic concerns and so on. Uh, so I, I, I think the other, the, the left kind of fails to conceive of it in this way. They'll, the left can be insightful and in looking at ways in which American corporations or banks are profiting off empire and et cetera. And, and I think that that is true. Uh, but I think the left, it ultimately fails to understand what's really happening uh, precisely because the left itself is trapped in this uh, cage of liberal thinking. Uh, and so I, I think this is where Schmidt is extremely relevant. Um, and uh, he is the thinker to look to, to understand the ongoing and, and, likely deepening crisis of the American empire. Yeah, yeah anyone got uh, a response? Oh, Joe, you're about to jump in. Well, I mean, I could um, say what I think we should, like how to move from what Schmidt has to say into actually applying things in the practical. I don't think Schmidt really gives us a clear idea of what to do. I think if you want a, a kind of where I would look, I should say, for advice on how to actually construct a praxis out of this, because all we've done so far is really just talk about how liberalism sucks for ages. And I spent a lot of time doing that and uh, I'm pretty good at it, but that there's got to be something more than that. Uh, Adam Katz, uh, I'm very inspired by his work. Um, and he, in the previous uh, episode of EBL, we were discussing Kant, but I spent most of the time talking about Adam's work actually 
talking about his concept of the disciplines and how they relate to sovereignty. Because what you get with this um, separation of the juridical order uh, from sovereignty is this, uh, this space is set up where you have this disciplinary inquiry into the true and the just and so forth that's, that's completely outside of, in the way it conceives itself, outside of an independent of sovereignty and divinity and some kind of someone actually issuing a set of valuations and imperatives, um, just inquiry for the sake of inquiry into inquiry. Um, now, Adam says this, the kind, the, the kind of consciousness, the, the, the fundamental structure of the discourse that produces all of the different scientific and philosophical disciplines um, needs to be reconfigured and re-understood in terms of what he calls interrogative imperativity, uh, which essentially means understanding the disciplines as uh, fundamentally deriving their authority and their purpose uh, to inquire from some kind of centralized authority. Um, and through this process uh, of like entering disciplines of like economics, sociology, whatever, political theory, what, whatever discipline you can pick that's politically relevant and reframing the entire structure of what that discipline is inquiring into in terms of um, sovereignty, uh, in terms of some kind of fundamental political identity, its valuations uh, and embedding it back within that structure is the only way out of this mess of this um, proliferation of all of these spaces of critique and endless discussion um, that never ultimately reach any kind of conclusion, any kind of decision. Um, so that's where I see like things need to head in is like, okay, so what does that actually look like? How do we set up institutions, set up uh, new forms of media, create a new political identity, which is about recuperating all of this um, basically liberal confusion, recuperating the great discussion and subordinating it uh, and uh, back to some kind of centralized conception of what's valuable, a, a, a fundamental political identity that uh, and, and, and set of valuations that, completely encapsulates what we're doing, why we're doing it, uh, and what it's for. Um, and so the problem that we're trying to solve here is fundamentally nihilism, but solving it on this institutional, a participatory institutional interaction with knowledge itself in a way that actually does that. I, I don't think that's the complete answer. I mean, there's more work to be done, but that general idea I think is quite profound. Um, then putting it into practice becomes, I think, a hell of a lot more complicated. And I think we still need to do more work on that. I don't think any of us really have the full answers yet. Um, but I think we've got the critique of liberalism down. So I think we're ready to move beyond it now and start really focusing on what does it actually look like strategically um, to start taking control of political discourse beyond just our little dissident rights sphere and actually entering into the disciplines that control how people conceptualize the political and their own identities and, and their morality and our inquiries into what is true and, and actually start organizing these things according to these kinds of post-liberal ideas. Yeah, I think we all ultimately agree on that, really. I mean, you could see it in the name dissident, right? Right. That's just a name for a state that we're a distant of the system, but we haven't come up with a productive path yeah. forward. And that's a our task that we it's kind of contradictory in a, in a way. I mean, to, to, can you be a right wing dissident? I mean, being it's kind of, a, you know, an, an alternative right or, you know, what all these terms there. I think they're good in the sense that they're contradictory. Uh, a, a dissident is the uh, is kind of a liberal posture in a way. Uh, the right is the opposite of that. The right is looking towards established order and institutions. But I, I think that that contradictory term does, you know, express yeah. where we are. We shouldn't be building our identity around dissidents. We should, I've put I forward, we need to build our identity around something like a vanguard or an avant-garde, basically a, a task force on the front lines entering into the confrontation with the enemy mm -hmm. uh, and, and innovating uh, a, a, in how we're going to fight them and, and striking the first blows. That's how we need to be conceptualizing ourselves, not sitting back and just being like, well, fuck the system, liberalism right. is retarded. Um, right. Well, I mean, that's the same totally in the positive sense. Well, I mean, if you read Dominic Venner's for a positive critique, I mean, that's the same, exact same problem he's highlighting in that 40-page pamphlet, is that it's stuck in this 
dissonant mode, this contradictory mode between being right and being dissonant, and it doesn't have a mm-hmm. clear vanguard. And that's what he's trying to establish in that work, right? It's a it's a problem that we've had since you know the the German conservative revolution, all this proliferation of different groups with lack of direction. And uh, with that, uh, Nils, you had yeah, something. When I, while I was editing that book, the English translation of that book, the the analogies to our, our current state, obviously our movement is uh, the IQ, uh, we're one standard deviation lower than the conservative revolutionaries. Uh, granted, uh, the analogies uh, hold. I mean, all of the problems that they were running into are the other problems that we are. Yeah, that's what struck me when I read that book. <laughs> yeah, it's like I could like I could like put a name to all these archetypes, yeah. like the same thing. I could just name the same people. Like, yeah, oh, same. Trump was kind of literally Hitler in the sense as well. <laughs> really shit Hitler. <laughs> yes, yeah. I know. <laughs> the 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 left calls Trump Hitler. My reaction is usually like, you know, I wish, but <laughs> like, I wish he was doing these cool things that you described right. to him, but he's really not. Um, right. Actually, he's actually he's a lot more like Hindenburg, yeah, which is uh, relevant when we're talking Schmidt because of his uh, his uh, focus on the status of the Reich president as as the the safeguard of the constitution and stuff like that, and uh, the one with with regards to Hindenburg, uh, who was rather old and, and uh, not really fit in the hat and got pushed around by his his numerous uh, uh, his numerous um, aides and uh, people who were uh, advising him. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think we should not uh, push the analogy too far. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> um... Nils, I know you wanted to bring up an uh, anecdote about Kojev and Schmidt. If you want oh, yeah, to- it's, it's, it's funny that uh, that Richard mentioned uh, Kojev because uh, w- one of the best things uh, about Schmidt is that he kind of knew every relevant intellectual, uh, intellectual that mm-hmm. lived during his time. And uh, <clears throat> he outlived most of his own critics and enemies and most of his students, uh, sadly. Uh, but anyway, he was also acquainted with uh, Alexandre Kojev, who, uh, whom he met in the early 1950s, I believe. And Kojev had before that written uh, an extensive work on Hegel in which he uh, critiqued Schmidt's concept of the political. Uh, so the two of them met and uh, uh, as, as with most uh, leftists, uh, Schmidt was uh, not actually a, a, a close friend of theirs, but uh, they stayed in touch and uh, they were able to to uh, to be productive and and to discuss their respective ideas. And in 1957, uh, Schmidt organized a lecture of Kojev's uh, in in Western Germany for hmm. an elite circle of uh, industrialists about. Uh, neo-colonialism and post-colonialism and stuff like that but the most Mm. funny and interesting thing is that uh organized by uh jacob talbis who was also a friend and a student uh, of schmidt's um all of those big names uh, people people should uh, probably look into them talbis was the one who coined the term immanentizing the eschaton which mm. uh, people might know from the illuminatus trilogy uh, but anyway talbis organized this uh, trip of uh, alexandre kojev from uh, peking to west berlin where uh, the radical socialist uh, Student Union, the SDS, uh, under under Rudi Dutschke and uh, I believe the the main uh, SDS theoretician Hans Jürgen Kral uh, still lived back then. He was actually the one who got the uh, radical socialist students to read Schmidt's uh, theory of the partisan. Uh, hmm. I, be- I believe it was that one, uh, and what kind of uh, spawned talks about uh, being urban guerrillas and stuff like that, which would uh, later uh, lead to the Red Army faction in Germany. But uh, those students were eager to uh, to hear a lecture uh, by Kojev, who was uh, a, a big name in uh, radical socialist and uh, social revolutionary circles. And uh, Kojev went to the event they, they uh, put out there, especially for him, and he stayed for about... Uh, two hours and uh, 
then he just got up and got ready to leave. And when they asked him where he wanted to go, he said, I'm going to Plettenberg to meet Carl Schmidt. And uh, they mm. were all kind of shocked because uh, Schmidt, of course, was a pariah back then and wanted to know why. And uh, then Kojev said, uh, well, <laughs> I don't see any other relevant German to talk to around, so uh, it's got to be Schmidt. And when they finally asked him what, uh, if, if, if he had at least one advice to give to them, uh, he said, you're putting way too much emphasis on what is happening now. The best thing you can do right now is to learn ancient Greek. Hmm. Then he got away and uh, met Schmidt, who was uh, speaking, speaking and writing ancient Greek, as well as uh, Latin and Spanish and uh, Italian and English and French. Uh, when you get into his writing on a, on a deeper level, you also see that his writing style, which is uh, pretty vivid, but also a bit shrouded. So he, he has been mm -hmm. compared to Heraclitus by some, uh, yeah. is very much influenced by uh, Roman literature, by Romanic literature, and, and especially the uh, French and Italian uh, uh, theoreticists he mentioned, like uh, Donoso Cortés, especially, and uh, Louis de Bonald and uh, Joseph de Mestre. Hmm. I, I agree uh, uh, completely with that. That uh, the, the way you describe Schmidt's writing, uh, it's uh, entirely lucid. You could even say simple, particularly in comparison with reading, you know, Theodor Adorno or or uh, uh, so, you know uh, other contemporaries in the German language. But then, yeah, it it does have a shrouded or, or evocative quality uh, to it that I, I I think makes it an amazing. Uh, in terms of literary qualities. I'll mention one quick anecdote. Um, I first read uh, Carl Schmidt in 2003 when I was at the University of Chicago. And uh, I was uh, in this apartment in Hyde Park that I, uh, it was actually quite a big apartment. It had this big center room and small little bedrooms and I shared it with um, uh, three other students. And so it was a great, it was the perfect apartment to host parties, in fact. Uh, because it was tiny bedrooms, but, you know, closets, basically, and then this massive kind of great room. I actually was in, um, I was I was around U of C uh, a few months ago with Edward Dudden, actually, and we uh, walked by my old apartment. Um, hopefully, there'll be a little, you know, it will be put into historical preservation or something at some point, and there'll be little plaques, or, or I don't know, maybe they'll demolish it. We'll see. <laughs> One or the other, perhaps, will happen. But uh I, there was this party and, um, you know, as these things are, you know, you invite 20 people and, you know, like the coronavirus, they, it has, you know, they, they invite another three or four. And so all these people you've never even heard of show up at your party. And, uh, I was actually in my kitchen and, uh, we were just kind of talking shop and, uh, there was this, uh, you know, I was in my early to mid twenties. There was this, you know, guy who was in his, I think early thirties, uh, who was a, uh, uh, noted uh, postgraduate student who was, you know, getting getting paid peanuts, but kind of hanging out at U of C and, you know, screwing undergrads, um, which if you know anything about the University of Chicago, that's uh, 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 not exactly the, the greatest compliment to be uh, seducing uh, U of C students. <laughs> uh, the, the nerd factor is high, let's just say, but putting that aside, um, he, uh, we were talking about, uh, uh, politics and, um, he basically told me, he was like, you are a fascist. He was like, don't pretend that you're anything other than a fascist. And I was like, well, okay. Uh, and then he was like, um, you know, you, you need, you, you need to, you should probably read Schmidt, but you should probably try to properly understand Schmidt. And, um, I, I didn't know at the time, but I was speaking to Gopal, uh, uh, Balakrishnan. Um, who actually wrote a book on Schmidt um, that uh, called The Enemy that was one of the early works in the English language. And he actually eventually became the editor of the New Left Review. I don't know what he's up to now, um, but back in the early 2000s, uh, he was hanging out in my kitchen, getting drunk and attempting to seduce UFC nerds. Uh, so there, uh, I've, you know, an amusing anecdote, but that, that is, he, he did introduced me to Schmidt and um, perhaps correctly identified me as well. Yeah, I mean, my introduction to Schmidt, I, I guess these are good anecdotes, I guess. Yeah. Mine's not nearly as fun, but mine came from uh, back of the underground editing a theology book 
during my undergrad called Paul Philosophy and the Theo Political Vision. And so that, that's where my introduction to Schmidt came from was through editing this series of essays. But um, it, it, this kind of gets to what I was saying when it comes to reading Schmidt today. And I know this is going to sound like a sentiment because we still got three more episodes on this to go. But ultimately what I'm trying to do is reinvigorate theopolitics as opposed to political theology, this active understanding of breaking when you break the distinction between theology and philosophy through this reinvigoration of phenomenology as returning to the things themselves, but not in the pure transcendental sense that we think of in how Husserl is usually misread, but rather in we take the so-called religious appropriations of phenomenology. When you take what does it mean to return to the things themselves seriously, you start encountering the notion of saturated phenomenology, the production of the of the experience of the divine, the world, and renewing the sense of the sacred. Now, I know that's just a tease because we still got a long way to go, but that's for the sake of time where I would put my taking Schmidt's critiques forward to something productive. Um, FC, you got anything to ask before we add, before we get to questions? I think this has been really good so far. Uh, I agree. I, I I think it's it's kind of trite just to say what people have said before. It's true. Every every political idea and movement needs a physical infrastructure. You need people to know each other in, in real life, in real time. You need to form connections. You need money. You need influence. All of that's true, but all of that's been said. Um, seeing as it is, the premise of this is a kind of book club, um, a, an idea out of left field, but one that has kind of captured me recently is... Um, Moving away from purely looking at uh, theoretical stuff, which does tend to be heavy on just a, a kind of endless critique uh, of of liberalism, which is fun, but uh, but you know is limited in terms of the places it can take you, is actually biographies of of very uh, influential people, or indeed their autobiographies, their personal accounts and memoirs, because. You know, even if you look at a, a kind of interesting American figure like uh, Gore Vidal, in a way, I think he's almost forgotten now. No one reads him except an older generation of Americans. Mm -hmm. he, he was interesting in that he kind of, uh, without being a, without being a political figure, I think he once ran for a, for a Senate somewhere. Uh, he kind of knew half of the American ruling class. I mean, he personally knew all of these military elites and families that have contributed to the American military elite, uh, political elites, senatorial families. He personally knew the Clintons. I think he was on very good terms with, with Hillary. Uh, you know, take that however you will. Uh, but it's interesting, you know, a, a figure like that, he had a lot to say, some of it probably salacious about them, but, uh, but I think he also puts across in a way how that elite thinks, um, what it is they're looking for, who it is they relate to, how they can be approached. Uh, and I think that kind of can help, help us. It can help you understand uh, the psychological type uh, of, of our current elite, uh, how in a way to get in with them, uh, how to appeal to them. Um, yeah, so a bit out of left field, but uh, I thought that worth bringing up. Gore Vidal was also the one who wrote to Timothy McVeigh when he was in prison yes. and yeah. awaited his death sentence. So maybe that might interest some people in him. <laughs> I just wanted to say, because we're almost done as well, if we're going to take the friend-enemy distinction seriously, what that really means to me is forcing people to take sides in a liberal world. Right. So we live in a society where, oh, well, you know, I believe this, but you know, this person and this person has, 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 has a right to exist and has like a, a, has a, has a, has a space in society or whatever. If you're serious about having a political identity, about being an identitarian, that means first inquiring into who you actually are properly, figuring out what's sacred to you, who's actually in the hierarchy above you and respecting that, but also forcing everybody else to take sides so we can actually fight. Like liberalism is just this endless deferral of who's going to decide what's important, who's going to make a decision. So if we want a decision mm -hmm. to be made. We have to force people to identify with decision makers so that we can actually have this final contest and make a decision. Yeah, let's and that's get on. Really what, 
That's what politics. That's what politics. Uh, this is what politics is about. It's not about discussing ideas and convincing people of you know the, the FBI crime statistics or the truth of what you're saying. Mm-hmm. It's about figuring out: Are you on? Are you me or not? Are you one of us or are you yeah. against us? And then that's it. That's all it's about. And then organizing. Okay, who are we? And and you know, chances are you're not going to be at the top of the hierarchy of who we are. So get in line. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, and and figure out how do we actually organize a political identity properly and defend it and our concept of the political and who we are from our enemies. That's that's politics. That's what Schmidt's telling us, and I think that's very powerful. And I don't think that the specter of that idea is going to go away. Um, and it relates, I think, to his, this idea in Schmidt that liberalism and democracy uh, are fundamentally um, paradoxical. They're destined to clash. And we're seeing this right now, actually, with the rise of populism and the neoliberal elite saying, well, you know, they voted for Trump, they voted for Brexit, they need to vote again. We like, you know, like, keep voting until you vote how we want you to vote. Um, liberal values can't be voted away, minority rights can be protected, etc. This is, I think, the lines are forming in society, even though we have this, like, low agency boomer political culture that needs to have something done about it. Ultimately, the identities are splitting. This is naturally mm-hmm. happening. The, the stresses uh, upon us are, are provoking it. And so we need to commandeer that process. How do we seize the current situation and and lead it in a productive direction? Uh, that's the task that we face. And that's what I mean about being a vanguard, not mere dissidents. Yeah, for sure. No, I think that's where we all are. Also, I think uh, the way you articulated Schmidt there is should be a good corrective to the strange idea that circulates that we're in a culture war where we just need to rashly convince people. <laughs> that's that's uh, one big, uh, yeah, one big uh, issue I have. But it seems we're at the same place, and that's a good place to bookmark this and move into the questions, of which there actually is a couple. So I'm going to jump right into them. Uh, first, the ones that aren't questions, uh, Draugr said supporting the stream at Thamster, keep up the content donated five thank you very much from gustavian donated five it says looking good richard loving the casual look mm. thank you um now from dsa intactivist caucus he says spencer's been discussing party formation lately is he interested in sharing any specific details and for the rest of the panel, how do we become the sovereign we want to see in the world? So I guess we'll start with the first. Is he interested in sharing any specific details about party formation? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not interested in, in sharing uh, specific details, but I, I do think this gets back to what we just mentioned, um, which is this this false notion that you know politics is downstream of culture and we need to convince everyone and and then we'll just kind of win one day or you know we'll reach out to the people the trump voters and they'll, they'll turn to us or something yeah no i i i in the words of joel like let's get on with this fight like let's just do it let's have it out win or yeah. lose and that that that's ultimately where we need to go it's actually Strategy is, is quite simple, and, and I think so many people in our movement, they gain so much entertainment from strategy. You know, they'll, they'll have these endless forums and discussions just talking about strategy, and we'll, we'll play this, and this will lead to that, and that will lead to that. And, and so on. it's just, it's quite simple what needs to be done, and so we should just do it. Yeah, I agree. I mean, we had that discussion on the last episode I did with you when we talked about Hazoni where there's this weird idea going around because he doesn't sell as many books that he has less influence than us. But of course, he's, you know, no. he's speaking to Orban and Salvini. He's influencing the elites. He's having... Right? Yes. He's, he's he has a little influence. more influence than a Twitter personality who posts gay photos of male models. Yes. Slightly yeah, I, more. Yeah, and all, yeah. all these discussions of strategy are just kind of ways for getting rid of your own responsibility it's like we need yeah. to follow trump and that will create the condition where all these people wake up or we need yeah. everything to collapse and then there's you know, yeah the we need to spur bernie because that will create this new condition or acceleration yeah it, it's just I mean, those things might be true you know in some way but it it just doesn't matter we we can't predict all of these trajectories no no, no supercomputer could do it we, we've just got to be the change we want to see in the world what it comes down to for me, though, is how do people understand their political identity? Generally speaking, it's through uh, their uh, 
media, basically, social media, particularly more mm -hmm. and more, coordinating them into their tribes of political ideology with their certain trusted sources and so forth. So commandeering that process uh, is one aspect of what needs to be done. But the other aspect is looking around the elites and saying, well, which one of you guys uh, <laughs> actually give a shit about us? And to me, you got to look to basically the military elites and their associates. They're the only group that actually seem to care about America in the general, as opposed to their own uh, personal factional agendas. Um, and, and so how do we serve the factions, the noble factions that remain, that kind of keep you know, the American empire ticking over despite all of its retardations? How do we empower them and serve them and support their elevation? Um, and that's related back to the media question, because so much of conservative media, if you and conservative think tanks and so forth, if you trace their funding, go back to some kind of media, uh, a military industrial um, source. And so it's pretty clear that like they're the patrons of the right. Um, mm -hmm. And so uh, this is why I've encouraged seriously understanding the geopolitical situation um, moving beyond racial identitarianism toward uh, something a little bit more complex, because to understand how we're going to navigate our way out of this, we have to make sense of our relationship to these elites and our relationship uh, to one another in a far more profound way than merely we're white people and we're going to organize based upon that and like fuck the mm -hmm. elite. So. Anyone else want to chime in on that question? Because that was for the whole panel. Well, the question was how to become the sovereign that we would like to see, right? Mm -hmm. So I guess the answer is plain and simple. Dare to make a decision. It's actually just as simple as that. And that also implies dare to be political. Because I know that's that's a bit straying away from the book we're discussing here. But the, the main line of reasoning in Schmidt's the concept of the political is that there is no use in trying to pacify a society, especially not a pluralist and diversified society, because that is just impossible. Because when it gets pacified, it is no longer a society. Um, and there is nothing political left in there. And the most important part, uh, Richard already pointed out, correctly that uh, Schmidt is very well known for his poignant uh, entrances into uh, his text. But the most important part of the concept of political is actually its end, because there he says, once a people is no longer able or willing to hold, in, hold itself in the sphere of the political, this does not make the political go away. Right. It just means that a weak people ceases to exist. And uh, that is something very important for us nowadays. Well said. Uh, I think we're all in agreement there. So unless FZ, if you got something to add, I'll move on to the next question. No, go ahead, move on. All right, so uh, I'll direct this to you, FZ, first, just <laughs> if you haven't said much in a, a little bit, you haven't had the chance. So. From Lawrence for five, this is my first real tutorial on Schmidt. I'm assuming he thought Christianity was gay or <laughs> thought. <laughs> no. <laughs> he was, uh, he was a, a pretty devout Catholic up until at some point in, in his 20s, at which point um, at, at which point it kind of faded into the background for him. It's, it's kind of ambiguous to what extent he was a Catholic off to that point uh, because he said, he basically said it faded in importance. Um, no, he, he doesn't think he doesn't think Christianity is gay or anything like that. He may not have thought that it was the way forward. Uh, but the rest of his work, as I kind of intimated, talking about all of these predominantly Spanish and French uh, ultra -Monta ultra Montanism is just a, a a a preoccupation with the the ultimate sovereignty of the Pope in both spiritual and and in temporal affairs. Uh, and, you know, as I said, talking about Cortez, he's, he's very, very interested in these authors. I think uh, it's perfectly fine to say that he, to the end, respected Christian, like the, the imperial Christian past uh, as, as a historical artifact, you could say. That's definitely true. Uh, he definitely gives Christianity its due. Uh, 
Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, he's not he, he's not a Christian in the way that conservative Christian authors are today, no. where they, <laughs> they, they look to the Bible for little nuggets of wisdom and, you know. Uh, he was the least hot, gay kind of Christian. In, yeah, exactly. Mm. Hot button issues and, and so on. I know that that is uh, gay, uh, figuratively speaking, uh, 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 whether it's literal or not, I'll uh, leave up to our audience. Uh, but uh, no, I, notions of incarnation uh, and, and so on, the, 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 the God coming into the world and so on are, are deeply important to his thoughts. So uh, he's, he's the kind of Christian that we should be looking to now and not, not to the, the, the popular ones that uh, uh, are telling you how God will pay off your mortgage or, or something like that. I think, I think there was this very attractive uh, middle-aged woman who's um, in, it has Trump's ear at the moment. I can't remember her name, but she speaks in tongues. She'll, Jesus will give you millions and, uh, uh, and, and so on. I'll, what, what is that? Uh, God, won't you buy me a color TV or? Uh, Televangelist. Or yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or uh, I, I, all my friends have Mercedes. I must make a, amends. God, won't you buy me a, a Mercy are a uh, Mercy. Uh, my, my friends, all, Benz, my friends yeah, all drive something. Porsches. I my friends all drive them. Porsches. Yeah, okay. That's when oh, you see Nils are German or Austrian knows it's more about American culture than than I do. Yeah, my friends all drive Porsches. I must make amends. God, won't you get me a Mercedes Benz? No, that Schmidt is the uh, exact opposite of that and the kind of Christian we should be looking to. <clears throat> Definitely. I think that's the last question. Let me take a look. That is the last question. All right, so I'm going to put this to an end. I think that was really good. The take-home message is, guys, stop trying to do politics without politics with this big mm. brain strategizing. Take the risk and jump in. So with that, I will close this. And thanks for listening, and we'll see you all next week.